Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Way back in 2018, our colleague Christopher Hasiotis sent Holly and me a note about the Lowry War as an episode suggestion. This isn't our first Christopher Hasiotis episode suggestion that we've done on the show. He's got, uh, he, he sends very good ideas, but it has taken me this long to do it because my short list of topics that I keep talking about has about three years of episodes oh. on it. And then in addition to having a, quote, short list of three years of episodes, I also just frequently get sidetracked off of it into stuff that's not even on there. So... The Lowry War is named for a group of outlaws that was headed by Henry Barry Lowry. And there are lots of different spellings for his name and consequently different spellings for the war. So you'll see it L-O-W-R-Y, L-O-W-R-I-E, L-O-W-R-E-Y, and L-O-W-E-R-Y. A lot of potential options there. Henry Barry Lowry, though, was Lumbee, and the Lowry gang, as it became known, included other members of the Lumbee tribe, as well as Black and white men, and they fought against Confederate authorities in southeastern North Carolina during the U.S. Civil War, and then during Reconstruction, they came to be known or came to be viewed as either kind of Robin Hood-esque folk heroes or dangerous murderers and thieves, depending on who you were asking. The Lowry War took place in and around Robeson County, North Carolina. That's in the southeastern part of the state in a swampy region around the Lumber River. Although Lumber is the river's official name today, too many locals, including the Lumbee tribe, it's the Lumbee. The origins of that name are a little bit hazy, but it's sometimes described as coming from the Algonquian term meaning dark water, and locals were using it for the river by the early 19th century. This part of North Carolina has been home to indigenous peoples for nearly 15,000 years, and the Lumbee have lived there for centuries. The Lumbee trace their ancestry to indigenous tribes and nations from at least three different language groups who have lived in what's now eastern North Carolina, southeastern Virginia, and northeastern South Carolina. In her books on Lumbee history, historian Melinda Maynor Lowry, who is Lumbee, describes 300 years of migration and cultural exchange taking place within this region. Indigenous people and people who had liberated themselves from slavery and white indentured servants and others all eventually settled in what's now Robinson County for various reasons, including fleeing from wars and diseases and persecution. And then together they formed one tribe that is deeply connected to the ideas of kinship and place. This tribe has been known by a series of names over the years. During the period of the Lowry Wars, they were often just called Indians, or described as a combination of multiple races. The state of North Carolina first recognized the tribe under the name Croatan in 1885. Okay, if you were thinking, wait, isn't that a lot like Croatoan, the word that was found carved into a tree at the former site of the lost colony of Roanoke? Yes, Hamilton McMillan, who introduced the legislation for the state to recognize the tribe with this name, had concluded that they were descended from survivors of the lost colony, and that was based on his own research. Two other formal name changes followed this before members of the tribe chose the name Lumbee in 1952, drawing that name from the place that the tribe calls home. There are also people within this group who trace their ancestry back to the Tuscarora and continue to use that name. The Tuscarora were living mainly in what's now North Carolina when Europeans started arriving in North America, and many of them moved northward to join the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in the 18th century. That was after the Tuscarora War. In this episode, we're just going to stick to the name Lumbee, even though we are mostly talking about a period before the tribe had chosen that name. This part of North Carolina is isolated, which made it a good place for people who were fleeing from wars or disease outbreaks or enslavement or any number of other things to take refuge and recover. It's also swampy, so it really wasn't very appealing to European colonists. 
So during the Revolutionary War era, a lot of Lumbee ended up formally owning the land that they were already living on and considered theirs. This included being granted land by either the Crown or the state of North Carolina, sometimes in exchange for service to one or the other or for military service. By the early 19th century, many Lumbee owned their land outright as individuals rather than living on land that belonged to the tribe collectively or was outlined in a treaty with the United States. From about the 1820s through the 1850s, the U.S. government systematically removed indigenous peoples from the eastern part of the country to land west of the Mississippi River. We have talked about this in some of our previous episodes, including our 2018 episode on the Georgia Gold Rush and our 2019 two-parter on the occupation of Alcatraz. This process involved federal laws, such as the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and multiple Supreme Court cases and exploitive treaties between the United States and indigenous nations and forced displacements. During this period, multiple indigenous nations that had historically lived in what's now North Carolina were forced to move, sometimes literally at gunpoint. This included the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole nations who were forced to move more than 2,000 miles to what's now Oklahoma, although some resisted and stayed behind. This removal was an act of genocide, and nearly a quarter of the people who were forced to move died as a result of it. The Lumbee, however, were largely protected from this removal. Many of the nations that the federal government forcibly removed during this period were living on land that was valuable in some way. So there was gold there or timber or prime farming land. But the Lumbee were mostly living among the swamps on land that wasn't considered particularly valuable. And as we've said, a lot of them owned that land outright as individuals, through documentation that the government recognized as legal. That didn't make it impossible for anybody to take their land, but it did make it more challenging to do so. And also, from a legal perspective, at this point, the Lumbee weren't legally classified as Indians. North Carolina revised its constitution in 1835, and under that constitution and various laws, the Lumbee were considered free persons of color. So even though they weren't forced off their land as many other tribes were, they also were not treated as equal citizens of the state. For example, free people of color were not allowed to vote in North Carolina. And although this law didn't specifically mention the indigenous people of Robeson County, a lot of people interpreted this provision as applying to them. In 1854, North Carolina also passed a law that voided marriages between a white person and a free person of color if that marriage had taken place since 1839. That applied to a lot of Lumbee marriages. These and other laws followed Nat Turner's Rebellion of 1831, which was an uprising of enslaved people in Virginia. Authorities were deeply fearful of a similar uprising taking place in other slave states, and so they passed a lot of laws to restrict any kind of rights that free Black people might have, and then more broadly, free people of color. When the U.S. Civil War started in 1861, North Carolina was a slave state. But the state and the people living in it were divided over whether to secede and support the Confederacy or to remain part of the United States, and this included the Lumbee. Although at least one Lumbee family had historically owned slaves, most Lumbee supported the Union. Even though free people of color had to have a special permit to carry weapons in North Carolina, Lumbee people served on both sides of the war. Some went to another state or passed for white to enlist, and some may have just found a recruiter who didn't know or didn't care about that prohibition. In 1862, the Confederate Army started fortifying Fort Fisher at the mouth of the Cape Fear River as protection for the nearby port of Wilmington. This was an earthen fortification, so its construction and maintenance were both labor-intensive and dangerous. At first, a lot of this work was done by Confederate soldiers and enslaved Africans. Diseases were rampant, especially malaria, dysentery, and yellow fever, which could be deadly. 
Eventually, landowners started refusing to send their enslaved labor to work on the fort because of all this. And at that point, the Confederates started conscripting indigenous people to do it, particularly the Lumbee. Although there were a few Lumbee who willingly went to work on the fort, most did not want to be forced to travel to the coast to do difficult, dangerous work for a military they didn't even support and possibly get sick or die in the process. So many responded by lying out in the swamps. As we said earlier, the swamps were easy to hide in, especially if you had lived there your whole life and had your own ancestral knowledge to help you navigate. But this made life difficult for the men who were lying out and for their families. Whether you usually worked on your own land or somewhere else, you couldn't if you were hiding out from the Confederates. All this fed directly into the Lowry War, which we will get to after a sponsor break. During the Civil War, Allen and Mary Lowry were two of the most affluent and prominent of the Lumbee people in Robeson County. Their family was large. They had 12 children. Almost all of them were sons. Allen was a church leader and also ran a successful farm, but he was also under a lot of suspicion from the Home Guard. The North Carolina General Assembly had established the Home Guard in 1863, and it was made up of men who, for whatever reason, were exempt from military service. The Home Guard was tasked with things like finding deserters and guarding strategic points within the state, helping to protect the local people. But in some areas, they really had a reputation for harassing or even terrorizing the local community. This is a big plot point in the book and movie Cold Mountain if anyone is familiar with that. The Home Guard accused Alan Lowry and other Lumbee of harboring Union sympathizers and Confederate deserters, and of things like stealing. And some of this really was going on. For example, Lumbee territory wasn't far from a stockade in Florence, South Carolina, and Union soldiers who escaped from there often wound up with the Lumbee, including with the Lowrys. In December of 1864, someone stole two pigs from James P. Barnes, who was a wealthy landowner and a slaveholder and a Confederate official. Barnes didn't live far away from Allen and Mary Lowry, and he thought one of the Lowrys had done it. That Basically, they didn't have food because they were lying out in the swamp, and so they stole his pigs. Possible culprit in Barnes's mind was their son, Henry Barry Lowry, who at about 18 was one of their youngest children. Barnes supported the Home Guard in trying to round up the Lowrys, many of whom were lying out in the swamp. On December 21st, 1864, Barnes was shot in an ambush, and before he died, he said that Henry Barry Lowry and two other men had done it. Not long after Barnes was killed, J. Brantley Harris, known as Brant, shot and killed Jarman Lowry, who was one of Henry Barry Lowry's cousins. Harris was a conscription officer for the Home Guard, and while the details on all of this are a little fuzzy, he seems to have mistaken Jarman for one of the other Lowrys. Two of Jarman's brothers, Wesley and Little Allen, had been working at Fort Fisher, and they came home on furlough. Harris claimed that they were both deserters, and so when both of them were killed, most people thought Harris was the person responsible. Although a grand jury charged Harris in their deaths, he wasn't arrested for it, so the Lowrys and a lot of the other Lumbee were outraged. Then on January 15th, 1865, Brant Harris was killed, presumably Henry Barry Lowry or one of his brothers, in retaliation for Harris having killed Jarman Wesley and little Alan Lowry, had done it. In some accounts, this all circled back to the pigs that had been stolen from James P. Barnes, and Harris had been investigating that theft when he was killed. After this, Henry Barry Lowry and some of his brothers stole some guns and ammunition, and they turned their attention to the wealthy white farmers of the area, especially wealthy white farmers who were clearly supporting the Confederacy. On February 27th of 1865, a group of Lowrys, along with some escaped Union soldiers, raided one of the wealthiest farms in the area, which belonged to the McNair family. Some of that family were at home, along with several Confederate soldiers. And although there was an exchange of gunfire during all of this, it doesn't appear that anybody was killed. 
The McNairs and their guests eventually surrendered, and then the gang stole things like food, blankets, and other supplies from the farm, and then distributed them to the poorest people in the area where they lived. At this point, that area had been given the derisive nickname of Scuffletown, although the Lumbee usually called it the settlement. On March 3rd, the Home Guard rallied a mob of about 100 people and went to Alan Lowry's home. The Home Guard claimed to find stolen property there, and they put Alan Lowry on trial along with his sons, Calvin, Sinclair, and William, and one of their neighbors. The Home Guard held Alan's wife, Mary, and some of the other women in the family captive in a smokehouse during and after the trial, questioning them about the whereabouts of other Lowrys. After this sham trial, everyone but Alan and William was allowed to go. But the Home Guard executed Alan and William by firing squad. Henry Barry Lowry reportedly witnessed this execution from the bushes. At this point, General William T. Sherman and the Union Army were moving north. This was after Sherman's march to the sea at the end of 1864 and his capture of the South Carolina capital of Columbia in February of 1865. Around March 9th, the army was near Lumbee Territory, bogged down by heavy rain and the swampy terrain. Some of the Lumbee, including some of the Lowry gang, guided Sherman's troops through the swamp and across the Lumber River. After the army had moved through, a Lumbee man named Hector Oxendine was murdered by white planters for having helped them. General Robert E. Lee surrendered on April 9, 1865, which is often marked as the end of the Civil War, even though the fighting continued for some time after that. Henry Barry Lowry and his gang continued to rob wealthy planters and raid their farms, and they evaded capture for months. On December 7, 1865, Lowry got married to Rhoda Strong, whose father was Scottish and whose mother was Lumbee, and the militia tried to take him into custody at his own wedding, falsely claiming that they had a warrant for his arrest. There were about 200 guests at that wedding, and a lot of people left after the militia arrived, but this still turned into a standoff in front of a crowd. It ended when the Justice of the Peace, who was officiating the wedding, that was a white man named Hector McLean, offered to be arrested along with Lowry, and both of them were escorted away. The militia did not think the local jail was secure enough, so they took Lowry to nearby Whiteville. Turned out that jail was not secure enough either because he escaped from it. According to some accounts, Rhoda brought him a cake with a file in it. At this point, the United States was moving into the post-war Reconstruction period with attempts to both recover and rebuild after the war and to rectify the inequities that resulted from the institution of slavery. Congress passed laws and constitutional amendments to try to protect the civil rights of previously enslaved people and others of African descent. Since North Carolina had seceded from the United States, it was required to write a new state constitution and to ratify the 13th and 14th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution before it could be readmitted to the Union. A lot of the indigenous people living in and around Robeson County thought their lives would get better during this process. A lot of them, even most of them, had supported the Union even after North Carolina had seceded. People in the tribe had also sheltered escaped Union prisoners of war. They directly aided Sherman in his move through the area. And there were some changes. The Reconstruction Acts of 1867 required the new state constitutions to include universal manhood suffrage. So North Carolina's 1868 Constitution restored voting rights for Lumbee men. There was a pause in the Lowry gang's raids around this time. The general conclusion is that Lowry and others hoped that by being able to vote, they would be able to make the changes they wanted to see in the government and in their own lives. But at the same time, the Lumbee were also largely excluded from the Reconstruction-era policies, programs and assistance that were meant to help bring racial, economic, and political equality to the newly freed people. Overall, radical Republicans who were driving these kinds of programs were focused on people of African descent rather than on indigenous people. And even though some of the Lumbee did have some African ancestry and there were people living at the time who thought that the tribe as a whole were mixed race or even black, they were largely overlooked. 
So by late 1867, as North Carolina's new constitution was still being drafted, the Lowry gang, presumably frustrated by this lack of progress, went back to raiding, or at least somebody started robbing stores and plantations in the area, and most people thought it was the Lowry's. People started demanding that the Lowry gang be declared outlaws and brought to justice. Henry Barry Lowry eventually agreed to turn himself in after being promised a fair trial, but soon there were rumors that he was going to be killed, that basically a lynch mob was going to get him out of his cell and drown him. Somehow he managed to get a knife and a gun, and he broke out of jail on December 12, 1868, when he was brought his evening meal. After Lowry's escape, the situation became increasingly violent. After the deaths of James P. Barnes and Brant Harris in late 1864 and early 1865, no one had been killed in the gang's raids. But between January of 1869 and June of 1871, multiple prominent people in and around Robeson County were killed, and those murders were pinned on the Lowry gang. This included Robeson County Sheriff Reuben King, who was killed in March of 1869, and Colonel Owen Normant, who was killed in March of 1870. At least 20 deaths are attributed to the Lowry Gang during this period, the vast majority of them Democrats or former Confederate officials. Although many were believed to have been involved in the execution of Allen and William Lowry or were bounty hunters trying to bring the Lowrys in, or were spies trying to infiltrate the gang, a few were essentially bystanders. We'll get to how the Lowry War ended after another sponsor break. By 1869, opinions about the Lowry gang were divided. To many of the poorest people in Robeson County, they were Robin Hood-esque heroes, not only robbing from the rich and giving to the poor, but also exacting vengeance from people who had been oppressing them. Wealthy white landowners, on the other hand, generally thought they were murderous thieves. The Republican Party, which was in charge of the North Carolina legislature at this point, was divided as well. Some vehemently denounced the violence and especially the killing, while others saw it more as the inevitable outcome of the long history of oppression in the area and even as something that might be necessary for the Lumbee to reach their political goals. In the end, though, the Republican Party took a law and order approach, focusing on the need to end the violence and to bring the Lowry gang to justice. And they made their arguments with some false equivalents, drawing parallels between the Lowry gang and the Ku Klux Klan, equating the gang's targeting of former Confederate officials with the Klan's campaign of intimidation and terror against the state's non-white population. On March 5th, 1869, Judge Daniel L. Russell Jr. issued a proclamation of outlawry. It declared that, quote, one Henry Barry Lowry, one Andrew Strong, one Boss Strong, one Shoemaker John, one John Dial, and one William Chavis of Robeson County have committed sundry and diverse murders, burglaries, robberies, and other felonies. And that said, Henry Barry Lowry, Andrew Strong, Boss Strong, Shoemaker John, John Dial, and William Chavis do conceal themselves and evade arrest and service of the usual process of law. Now, therefore, I, the said Daniel L. Russell Jr., judge as aforesaid, by virtue of the authority vested in me by an act of the General Assembly in such case made and provided, do issue this my proclamation, hereby requiring the said Henry Barry Lowry, Andrew Strong, Boss Strong, Shoemaker John, John Dial, and William Chavis, and each and every one of them forthwith to surrender themselves to the Sheriff of Robeson County, or to any other sheriff or lawful officer of the state. And I do also empower and require the sheriff of Robeson County or of any other county where the said felons are supposed to lurk and conceal themselves to search for and pursue with all power of the county and effectually apprehend said fugitives from justice. It went on to say, quote, and I do further declare that if the said fugitives or any of them continue henceforth to stay out, lurk, or conceal themselves and do not immediately surrender themselves, 
any citizen of the state may capture, arrest, and bring them or him to justice. And in case of flight or resistance, after being called on and warned to surrender, may slay them or any one of them without accusation or impeachment of any crime. Bounties were announced for the Lowry gang, including one of $12,000 for Henry Barry Lowry, who was to be brought in dead or alive. The governor of North Carolina also asked for help from federal troops, and those troops arrived in November of 1870. A posse was also formed to hunt for the gang, and there was a series of shootings, ambushes, and other violence. In February of 1871, Henderson Oxendine was captured. Within the Lumbee community, he's believed to have intentionally allowed himself to be caught with the hope that he could take the blame for the gang's activities. He was tried, convicted, and executed for killing a man named Steve Davis, who had been killed during a confrontation with the gang. Later in 1871, Francis Marion Wishart captured the wives of several members of the Lowry gang, basically holding them hostage unless the gang surrendered themselves. Henry Barry Lowry and some of the other men replied to this threat with a note on July 14th demanding that the women be released by that Monday morning. Otherwise, quote, the bloodiest times will be here than ever was before. The life of every man will be in jeopardy. In the end, the women were all let go, and like that attempt to arrest Henry Barry Lowry at his own wedding, this whole incident wound up bringing the Lowry gang even more popular appeal. On February 16, 1872, there was a raid on Pope and McLeod's store in Lumberton, North Carolina, and thieves also stole a safe from the sheriff's office. Together, they got away with about $20,000 and Henry Barry Lowry disappeared not long after that. Word spread that he had died, possibly by an accidental self-inflicted gunshot. But there were also a lot of stories about a possible escape and where he may have gone afterward. In one, he went all the way to the West Coast, was part of the Modoc War between the Modoc people and the U.S. Army in 1872 and 1873. Regardless, he was never captured, and that $12,000 reward went unclaimed. Although the violence continued in North Carolina after Henry Barry Lowry's disappearance, over time, most of the rest of the gang either disappeared or were killed or captured. Francis Wishart was killed in May of 1872 after having agreed to a meeting with Stephen Lowry and Andrew Strong, The end of the Lowry War is usually marked as sometime in February of 1874 when Steve Lowry was killed by a bounty hunter. A year after that, Mary C. Normant, who was the widow of Colonel Owen Normant, who the gang had previously killed, she published a history of the Lowry Band, which is both the earliest written account of all this uh, and also really unfavorable in the treatment of the Lowrys, unsurprisingly, given that they murdered her husband. Over these years, the Lowry gang had become famous. Notorious outlaws Frank and Jesse James claimed to be members at some point. Their activities were covered in national newspapers like the New York Times, and Harper's Weekly published a write-up on March 30th of 1872. In more recent years, the musical drama Strike at the Wind made its debut on July 1st, 1976, after years of work on it. It was written by a white playwright, but it involved the work of a tri-racial organization and planning committee, and it was a mostly indigenous production. There were other dramatic productions before this point, but most of them were biographical treatments focused on Henry Barry Lowry, and this was focused more generally on the Lowry War. The hope was that this play would provide a sense of cultural cohesion and pride among the Lumbee and educate non-Lumbee about Lumbee culture and history. And there were hopes that it would become an ongoing tourist attraction like some of North Carolina's other outdoor historical dramas. This includes The Lost Colony, which started in the 30s, and Unto These Hills, which is about Cherokee history, up through the removal, and that was first performed in the 50s. Although that didn't happen, the play was performed annually for about 10 years, and then it returned in 2017 after a 10-year hiatus. Yeah, I think it either is being performed or has been performed for some uh, showings this year. Um, I do not remember if that was before or after this episode will be out, though. 
Some historians have concluded that the Lowry gang and the government's response to the gang had an enormous impact on North Carolina politics toward the end of the 19th century, with the Republican Party's division over how to handle it and then the ultimate decision to take a law and order approach, leading the Lumby vote to swing toward the Democrats and then hastening the Democrats' return to power in North Carolina. And the Lumbee tribe continues to be influential in North Carolina politics. North Carolina is a swing state, and the tribe has been described as a group of swing voters within that state. In 2020, there were so many news reports about how Robeson County had been, quote, a Democratic stronghold before voting for Donald Trump in 2016 and electing Trump by an even larger margin in 2020. One of the factors that was cited in 2020 is Trump's announcement that he supported the Lumbee Recognition Act. That's an act that would grant the tribe full recognition by the federal government. Because currently, the Lumbee tribe is not fully federally recognized. In 1956, President Dwight Eisenhower signed a law that recognized the Lumbee as an Indian tribe. But, quote, nothing in this act shall make such Indians eligible for any services performed by the United States for Indians because of their status as Indians. And none of the statutes of the United States which affect Indians because of their status as Indians shall be applicable to the Lumbee Indians. This makes the Lumbee the largest non-federally recognized tribe in the United States, with 55,000 enrolled members and 70,000 people identifying as Lumbee or part Lumbee in census records. Although many Lumbee live in and around Robeson County today, there are also significant Lumbee communities in other parts of the U.S., including Baltimore, Detroit, and Philadelphia. Although that 1956 legislation barred the Lumbee from most federal programs, many took part in the Urban Relocation Program. That was a federal program to move indigenous people out of reservations and into cities. This was another attempt to get indigenous people to assimilate with white society. Today, Baltimore is home to the largest Lumbee community outside of North Carolina as a result of that program. The idea of federal recognition for the Lumbee tribe has been controversial. Legislation has been reintroduced at the federal level a couple of times over the last few years, and each time there have been vocal opponents to it, including in some cases from the leaders of other indigenous nations. For example, in 2020, Principal Chief Richard Sneed of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians argued against federal recognition for the Lumbee before the House Subcommittee for Indigenous Peoples. Sneed cited a number of reasons for this opposition. One of the tribe's earlier names that we talked about in the top of the show was the Cherokee Indians of Robeson County, a name that was outlined in a law introduced by a white legislator, but also had the support of some members of the tribe. Another reason is that federal law generally recognizes indigenous nations that have a governing body and political structure that predates the establishment of the United States. But the Lumbee have described themselves as an amalgamation of multiple tribes and language groups that came together in one geographic area. Sneed's testimony before the House also contends that the Lumbee have no indigenous ancestry. This is obviously very complicated. Sneed is not the only person who has um, spoken out against this recognition. That is just the congressional testimony that I had access to. Most recently, this legislation to recognize the Lumbee has passed the House. It was received in the Senate in November of 2021. This legislation would strike out Section 2 of that act that had been signed into law in 1956. That was the section that specified that the recognition didn't extend to the tribe receiving any benefits as an Indigenous nation. So this would extend federal recognition to the tribe and, quote, all laws and regulations of the United States of general application to Indians and Indian tribes shall apply to the tribe and its members. As a side note, something else that has been on Tracy's shortlist forever is the Battle of Hayes Pond. That is the name given to a 1958 incident in which the Ku Klux Klan was planning a rally in Maxton, North Carolina, which is partly located in Robeson County. Fifty or so Klansmen arrived for the rally where they were vastly outnumbered by hundreds of Lumbee, many of them armed. After someone shot out the one light bulb the Klan had for illumination, they fled, and although other gunfire was exchanged, no one was killed. 
Yeah, one of the reasons that's never made it into a full episode is that um, that's... The whole story. Without all the, <laughs> without all the context that we just covered here... <laughs> That is, uh, that's most of the story. Uh, but it is one that the Lumbee take a whole lot of pride in and is generally described as like the Lumbee running the clan out of North Carolina. Uh, so that is the Lowry War. Do you have listener mail as well? I do. I have listener mail from Annette. Annette wrote and said, Hi, Holly and Tracy. My husband and I have the good fortune but to be traveling to Germany and Austria in September, and I wondered if there are past podcasts related to Munich, Salzburg, Hallstatt, Milk Abbey, the Habsburgs, Vienna, etc. I missed the archive. I also wanted to share a couple of things related to recent podcasts I think you will find interesting. The first item relates to William Marsh Rice. My husband and I are both alumni of Rice University and have been following with interest the work of Rice's task force on slavery, segregation, and racial injustice. One of the co-chairs, Alex Byrd, is a friend of ours. Among the task force's changes was what to do with the founder's statue that is in the main campus quadrangle. You can read more at the links below. The second item is a sculpture that was inspired by the Lao Kun. The work is by the South African artist Wimbotha and is entitled Prism 10, Dead Lao Kun. We've seen it at two different hotels. It's very powerful. See below and attached. We look forward to another live show in Houston when you're touring again. I was the one who gave you a postcard from the Mutual Museum. This is from Annette. So thank you so much, Annette. I wanted to read this because number one, I had missed that update about Rice University's uh, decision to move the statue of the uh, founder, William Marsh Rice, to another place. That is something that we had talked about briefly in that episode. And so that is a decision that was made earlier this year to relocate that statue. Uh, The other thing is, I also missed the archive, even though our old website went away at this point I feel like three or four years ago, it was before the pandemic that the old website went away. Uh, We'll still occasionally get emails from folks saying something like, what happened to the old website? And we no longer have it. And it was was not within our ability to change. We also missed the archive, but our archive wasn't quite granular enough to have made it, uh, I think, easy to find episode podcasts related to these particular places related to Germany and Austria. Um, So I did dig up a few. Uh, We have stuff on Rudolf II of Austria and Empress Sissi. Lola Montez, tangentially related, also a fun listen. Uh, And then Maria Anna Mozart would be uh, classified as related to that also. We've said this before on the show, but at this point... The easiest way to find episodes on specific topics is either to use a podcast player that's searchable, because our our website is not, uh, or to Google the topic that you're looking for along with the words stuff you missed in history class. I have found that recently the Google algorithm just also also wants me to have the word iHeart in there because nothing can be easy. Um, (laughs) So... That would bring up things like Germany and Austria if they were referenced in the episode description. The tags that we used for the episodes were not ever something that was part of the actual RSS feed. So even though they were are part of the old website, it's not a thing that is like facing users anymore. And it also wasn't quite as granular uh, as the topics that Annette asked for suggestions related to. So thank you again, Annette, for this. Uh, hope that folks are looking for old episodes of the show or able to find them by something more searchable than our website, which is not searchable. If you would like to write to us, uh, we're at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. We're all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you will find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and wherever else you like to get podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.